Okay, I guess uh, we can begin. So um, this is the second lecture uh, about uh, particle and cell codes and kinetic simulations of plasmas. Uh, last time we um, went through the description of how electrostatic codes work and how we discretize the plasma on the grid using particles. And um, we started discussing electromagnetic particle and cell codes uh, where we uh, covered the uh, integration of Maxwell's equations uh, on the numerical grid and uh, how we integrate particles using uh, Boris pusher. Uh, and um, these couple together to give us uh, a self-consistent system that can evolve both electromagnetic waves uh, and particles. So uh, a crucial piece of this uh, uh, is to couple particles back to the grid. So uh, getting information from the grid was just in interpolating electric fields and magnetic fields to the location of the particles. But um, in order to advance electromagnetic fields, you needed to deposit particle charge and current back onto the grid. And uh, for this, we discussed several ways of uh, depositing um, on the grid using um, uh, <coughs> either first order or second order or higher shape order uh, functions that uh, can uh, discretize a particle back onto the grid. And um, one of the uh, important things was to talk about conservative charge deposition. So I'll, I'll finish off a few details about that. And we'll talk about um, how what kind of boundary conditions we can apply to these codes, how to run them on uh, big machines, and I also mention some things about hybrid simulations. And then we'll probably s switch into uh, applications uh, and examples of how these codes are applied to astrophysics. So um, <coughs> in electromagnetic code, uh, we <coughs> try to not solve the um, full Poisson equation, because Poisson equation is an elliptic equation, and it doesn't usually scale very well on uh, large, uh, large computers. So uh, we try to make um, uh, what's called charge conservative uh, current deposition, which uh, satisfies the um, ch conservation of charge to machine precision. And uh, this allows us to evolve only the hyperbolic part of the Maxwell's equations without touching the Poisson equation. So if Poisson equation is satisfied initially, it will be satisfied uh, further uh, in the evolution. The, um, <coughs> the nice side effect of this is that uh, static uh, electromagnetic fields can be established dynamically. So if you start with a uh, configuration with um, uh, so okay, let, let, me, let me talk about this, this thing. So my initial state uh, satisfied Poisson equation, then if I evolve uh, using charge conservative deposition, it will be satisfied at, at every given uh, moment in time. So uh, <coughs> we, in our code, and most codes that I know, uh, people don't have a Poisson solver at all, which means that you have to start with electromagnetic field that satisfies your Poisson equation. Uh, and uh, the easiest thing to start with is electric field equals to zero. So you want to start with some sort of charge configuration which doesn't have a charge. Uh, so uh, either it doesn't have a charge or has a divergence of electric field equal to zero. For example, you can start with a constant electric field, such as a drift electric field, uh, or any kind of non-divergent configuration which doesn't have a charge. Then Poisson equation is satisfied by construction, and uh, you can evolve it um, in time. So if my initial charge density is zero, uh, this means that I have to initialize electrons and ions right on top of each other. Right? So if, I, if, I, if they're not on top of each other, then there's potentially charge fluctuations, and I have to uh, correct my electric fields for these potential sources. Uh, so an easy, a simple way to start is to just initialize everything to uh, be one on top of each other, so electrons are always on top of uh, protons, and uh, then you can uh, evolve from there. Now, if you have electron on top of a proton, of course, electric field is zero. Great. Now, let's say that uh, electron starts to move away from the proton, and I'm solving only the time-dependent uh, 
uh, evolution equations, what will happen is that there will be electromagnetic waves that start propagating, right? And slowly establish the electric field between these two charges. So even though I start with one on top of each other with no charge density, over time I will build up electric field, which looks like totally, uh, once all the transients leave, it will, what will remain is uh, purely the one over R squared electric field. And that's exactly what we're doing. So obviously this is the most expensive way to solve electrostatic. So if, you, if your problem really is electrostatic problem, don't do this. Uh, but uh, in our case, uh, speed of light and speed of particles can be comparable. So we're interested in relativistic problems. So it's not such a bad idea to do this. Uh, <coughs> okay, so <coughs> we, um, in print, so in, in practice, if I have to start with some charge density, what I usually do is I, char I start with zero uh, particles on top of each other, and, and then I move the, the particles to the right place, evolving the Maxwell's equations in time, and then I let them go. Right? So I can move them by hand. If I separate the charges by hand and still solve Maxwell's equations, everything will be happy, and electrostatic field will get established. So. Um, of course, you can make more elaborate uh, initial states if you do in invest into a Poisson solver. It's not such a big deal, especially if you only need to do it once. So um, <clears throat> an interesting side effect of charge conservation is um, that uh, what happens in the case when you start uh, with charge imbalance. For example, I only initialize electrons. So I forget about ions, and I only initialize electrons on the grid, uh, what will happen? Uh, what will happen is that my initial electric field is zero, right? which means that the code thinks that there is an opposite and equal charge density to my initialized electrons. So as my electrons leave uh, the, the place where they were initialized, an invisible ions will be just sitting there stuck to the grid. Basically, it, what, what the code sees is that uh, it's in a given cell, it sees that uh, something is leaving the cell. Electron is leaving the cell, so there's a current that's leaving the cell. The code is conserving everything, right? So the charge density in the cell will start changing in the opposite direction, right? Because there is a net outflow of current, so there must be a charge remaining. So even though I didn't initialize any particles for ions, they will be there on the grid. They will be not moving, they will be just stuck to the grid. But this is a, uh, an easy, a simple way to uh, simulate uh, infinitely massive ions. You don't even need to simulate them. They just, they're just there. <coughs> and um, <coughs> so <coughs> this will, um, uh, this way, for example, if I only initialize electrons, I give them a little push, uh, then you would think that they should, they should just start flowing, right? Except uh, they will remember that there are ions left behind and there will be electric field that's building up and slowly it will bring the electrons back. So you will, this is an easy way to initialize a plasma oscillation. Right? <clears throat> okay, so um, the, uh, this charge conservative deposition, uh, there, are, uh, there are expensive ways of doing it and there are some um, uh, adjustments that you can do to speed up things. So the original method that I described last time was uh, Velasenor and Buneman, where you just assume a volume of a particle and, and crossing the boundaries of the cell, and you count up how much volume crossed every, uh, every cell uh, phase. And um, that potentially leads to strange configurations where a particle can cross at most uh, several cells. And then you have to do a lot of if statements. So uh, an uh, improvement on this was proposed by Omeda in 2003. Uh, this method is called the zigzag scheme. And um, what it says is that uh, what I really care about is um, where are the initial location of the particle and the final location of the particle. And I don't really care how it got from one place to the other. So basically, uh, if I, <coughs> if this is my grid, and um, let's say that there is a, a particle that happened to be crossing over here, if you can see this. So this is an ugly situation because it will cut three cells, right? So uh, what I really care is that the particle went from here to there. I don't really 
care how, how it got there. So what ZigZag proposes is that to say, well, let's say that the particle always goes through the corner. So instead of depositing into these three cells, you can say that it did one jump to the corner and then another jump to the final location, and uh, that ends up being the same thing. So if, you charge, if you're conserving the charge, it doesn't matter how you got there. Uh, so <laughs> that's the zigzag scheme, and um, there is a implementation for uh, uh, first order zigzag, which seems to work. Uh, higher order zigzags, um, there are papers saying that they work. We've tried them and they don't. <laughs> so, um, so there is a, this is still missing. Um, there is a, as I mentioned, there is this method by Ezer Kapov, uh, which um, is kind of a, a Cadillac of high order schemes uh, on, uh, on for, with charge conservation. And um, it, uh, what it essentially does is that uh, it says, well, here's my shape. I will uh, s deposit it, I, I will just map it onto the grid. Here's a, here it was in the beginning, here it is in the end. And uh, what I need to find is the difference between these two shapes and, and assign it to currents that pass through all the possible interfaces uh, from one place to the other place. And uh, it turns out that there is a linear system you can solve and uh, there is one unique solution that satisfies uh, this equation. Uh, the problem is that it's like 25 times more expensive than doing uh, these kinds of schemes. So it can be done, it can be generalized to any, any order, it's just it can be very expensive. And so far we haven't found a very good um, shortcut uh, to do high order th uh, depositions uh, other than using this Cadillac of a method. <coughs> so, uh, so if you, if you want to do charge conservation, this is what you have to do. Uh, the alternative is to not do charge conservation at all and instead rely on Poisson solves. And uh, it turns out that you don't need to solve the Poisson equation on every time step. So there are several codes that uh, it, it kind of smells the same thing as uh, people have experience with divergence B cleaning in, uh, in MHD codes. So you don't have to solve Poisson equation exactly at every time step. You can correct your electric field once in a while. Uh, and that once in a while happens to be like every 10 to 100 steps. And uh, <clears throat> it seems to work. Uh, at least for the time scales people have advanced, uh, it doesn't seem to uh, create significant difficulties, but you never know. <laughs> you, know you always have to compare it with a charge conservative scheme if you're willing to push it long enough. So uh, if you are doing the Poisson equation, then you can just use the simple charge deposition like you did uh, for the charge. You can do the same thing for the current and don't worry about charge conservation. And then, uh, this simplifies the method a little bit. Okay, so uh, that's, the, that's the idea of how these um, methods work. So uh, there are several PIC codes in existence in electromagnetic codes. Uh, in, they're usually three-dimensional codes although almost nobody runs them in 3D all the time. Usually a lot of things can be done in 2D. And um, <clears throat> the basic idea is very similar. The, what's different is um, what I call special sauce. So there are different codes that do different uh, adjustments to the scheme to make it more appropriate for particular tasks at hand and uh, also to make it sometimes faster, sometimes slower and adjust them to, to fit their architecture. So uh, one of the things that uh, we do in our code, and I, I find it uh, extremely interesting and useful, is um, uh, kind of a, uh, what we call filtering. So filtering is a way to um, fake high order, uh, high order deposition on the grid with uh, first order deposition. So what we do is, um, we deposit the current with the first order spatial functions like I described before. And uh, then we collect the current and we filter it. Uh, I'll describe what filtering is, but it basically re removes the high frequency noise from the current. And um, this uh, filtering can be done many times and uh, it really smooths out the current, smooths out the particle noise that you have in the simulation. And um, <coughs> the Downside is that it's a little expensive. So in, in 3D, in the worst day, 
it could take 30% of a time step uh, filtering. Uh, in 2D, it's less, less of an issue. Uh, so uh, there are two kind of schools of thought on this. One school of thought is um, not do any kind of current filtering or any kind of smoothing and just use the simplest uh, current deposition, but uh, make your code so fast that you can push uh, you know, hundreds of billions of particles and you will compensate for the numerical noise with just putting a lot of particles in it. So that's the approach that's done by a code from Los Alamos called VPIC. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's been optimized to run on the fastest uh, and largest computers and it's really efficient. Uh, but it doesn't do any kind of current filtering or current corrections and uh, so it, in, it's intrinsically very noisy so it has to push uh, billions of particles. I can argue that on some pro problems you can get by with much fewer particles per cell uh, if you do filtering. For example, some of the problems uh, on shock physics and reconnection, uh, we can get by with four particles per cell in 3D whereas VPIC would be pushing hundreds of particles per cell. So, um, but it's not a panacea. I mean, it, it, what I want to say is that there is no, if you ask me what is the best number of particles per cell to use, it totally depends on what you're doing. Uh, there is no one recipe that I can give you. If it's less than a few particles per cell, you always worry. But whether it's 10, you know, 100 or 1,000 may totally depend on what you're doing. Also, it may depend on the dimensionality of the problem that you're working with. For example, one-dimensional codes require much higher number of particles per cell than, for example, three-dimensional codes. And this is very counterintuitive. Why would that be? Uh, one of the intuitive reasons why this could be the case is that in 1D, uh, all your noise is confined to one dimension. In 3D, a particle makes noise, but that noise is radiated in three dimensions and it falls off from the location of the particle. In 1D, your noise stays with you. So in 1D, we end up uh, requiring hundreds of particles per cell to achieve the same, uh, same uh, physics as we in 2D would be getting with 10 particles per cell. Um, it's not an absolute rule. I haven't proven this theorem, but this is an empirical uh, experience that I've had. Okay, so, uh, so let, let, um, let's see. Let me describe the filtering and then I'll come back to these other issues. So what is filtering? Uh, <coughs> what we're doing is we're essentially uh, smoothing, uh, oops, sorry. This, yeah, what, what we're doing is we're <coughs> trying to smooth the current. And uh, we do this for two reasons. One is to uh, improve agreement with uh, uh, this, uh, theoretical dispersion relations at long wavelengths. So if k delta x goes to zero, uh, this is called a compensation step. Uh, or another main reason is to uh, improve sh high frequency noise. So this is impro to improve overall accuracy and, and noise uh, at short wavelengths. So this, uh, uh, we want to reduce the noise at k delta x goes to pi. This is called smoothing or attenuating. and um, the idea is uh, we want to filter out the high frequencies. So if you had a Fourier code, so if you were solving field equations with a Fourier transform, you would just naturally truncate it at some high k and you wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't be an issue. Since we're not doing any Fourier transforms, we have to do it in grid space. So uh, for that, the term is called digital filtering. And uh, basically it's this. So for given quantity, in our case, uh, so in, in electrostatic cases could be a potential, uh, in our, or charge, or any kind of quantity. In our case, it's uh, current. Uh, we replace uh, a value of the current on the grid point with this kind of weighted average of its nearby values. And uh, this weight, uh, you can play with it, but um, I'll describe some values. Typically, half, uh, 0.5 is what's used. And um, notice that you cannot filter in place, meaning that you can just replace value uh, of the, uh, say, current at, at grid cell J with this formula because it depends on J minus one, uh, which you may have just updated on the previous iteration. So you want to keep a kind of a little buffer where you, you don't overwrite your array as you, uh, as you filter. So <coughs> the... Um, this is a very s trivial operation. You can think of it, again, uh, usually, usually using uh, in, in Fourier space. So if you uh, 
Fourier transform this filtered um, thing, uh, th filtered quantity, you find that um, uh, the filtered quantity is the uh, Fourier transform of the original thing times some attenuation or smoothing uh, kernel. And the smoothing kernel depends on the wavelengths at which you're uh, looking. And um, this is the typical profile of these uh, uh, smoothing profiles in, in K space. So this is Fourier transform. This is the smoothing function that you apply to the Fourier transform of your, uh, of your current. And uh, what you see is that, as advertised, uh, so it's uh, at, at high Ks, it's, uh, uh, it's falling off. So it's suppressing the high Ks. And it's, uh, it's a low-pass filter, essentially. So it passes the low frequency, low spatial frequency uh, things. Uh, you can, uh, so if weight is smaller than 0.5, then the smoothing uh, function reverses uh, sine. So it can actually, um, <coughs> uh, so it can, it can change the sine at some of the uh, wavelengths. Uh, and uh, if it's, uh, 0.5, it's always positive and approaches zero. So this is the 0.5. This is the d digital filter with W equals to 0.5, which is basically a weighting of uh, one to one. So, you, you, so if, uh, if this is uh, your cell, uh, you multiply it by two, add the nearby two, and divide by four. Okay, so, so this one is weighted a little more than your neighbors, but it, it, it smooths your you're to the kernel of, uh, of nearby uh, three cells. So you can apply this n times. So in principle, if you apply this n times, uh, this uh, smoothing function will, uh, will give you a cosine to the power of 2n. Uh, and so, so for if you, if you go once, you get cosine squared. If you go twice, you get cosine to the fourth, and so forth. And uh, you effective, you're, effectively, your uh, stencil uh, grows. So if you have... 3 point, 5 point, and 7 point as you increase uh, the number of filters you do. And uh, eventually, it approaches a Gaussian. So if you do it a million times, you know, an infinite number of times, it will approach a Gaussian uh, profile. <clears throat> uh, so an interesting um, uh, sub... Uh, um, Subiteration that you can do is uh, use a negative value of W. So if, the, if W is uh, minus one point, uh, one uh, six, uh, you can compensate. So what that does is it um, uh, takes some of the power that you killed at low frequencies and puts it back. So basically, this is uh, this is a what's called a compensated uh, filter. So this is the binomial filter, as, as we discussed over here. Uh, you apply that, and then you apply the uh, filter with minus one six, and that makes for this kind of shape. So it it still cuts high frequency stuff, but it uh, passes better the low frequency stuff. So this is a called a compensated uh, digital filter. So what you do is uh, you apply this once, and then you can apply the compensator. Typically, what we sometimes we don't use the compensator; it's not necessary. Uh, again, it depends on what you're doing, but typically you can get, get by without it. Um, the, uh, what we do is that this filter can be called many, many times. So uh, in our case, uh, we can filter anywhere from 4 to 128 times, uh, which is a lot. So it basically smooths your particle to a very large, uh, very large cloud. And uh, <clears throat> for most things, it doesn't seem to affect the physics. Uh, there's always going to be a, some problem where this will be an issue, if you're, especially if you're interested in very small-scale uh, physics, which you shouldn't be. Uh, but uh, if you are, then you, you can obviously overdo the filtering. But we found it uh, essential for uh, long-term success of our simulations and, and the expense of the simulations. Okay, so another thing that I wanted to uh, discuss is um, uh, we'll be applying this for uh, relativistic flows. And uh, in relativistic uh, simulations, there is uh, an ugly numerical instability that's called a, a numerical Cherenkov instability. And um, it's um, a little bit complicated, but I'll give you the pedestrian version of wh why there is a problem. It's not exactly right, but it's close enough. So remember that our uh, uh, 
finite difference time domain equations had a numerical dispersion. So what that meant is that the waves uh, at high frequent, at high spatial frequencies were propagating at a different speed from the speed of light. This is just a property of numerical scheme. Uh, normally that shouldn't be uh, a big deal. You're only worried about these very short wavelengths and uh, uh, the deviation is not that large. Uh, <coughs> however, if you're doing a relativistic simulation, uh, your particles can fly at very large Lorentz factors. So basically they're flying at the speed of light. So you can have a situation where your particle is flying at the speed of light, yet your numerical waves are propagating slower than the speed of light. And this could be like, you know, 10% slower than the speed of light. And now you have a particle moving faster than the speed of light in the medium, and that's a recipe for Cherenkov radiation, right? So uh, what, you, what you see is, is um, it, it displays very ugly properties. Uh, if you have a relativistic neutral beam trying to propagate uh, through the grid, it shouldn't be an issue. It should just propagate straightforwardly. Yet, if you run it for a long time with high gamma, what you find is that this beam warms up and stops. So it stops on the numerical grid. Uh, so it's uh, very unpleasant. And this very, it depends very strongly on gamma factor. So whenever you see our relativistic simulations, we usually don't go beyond gamma of 15. Uh, we can go for gamma of 100, but not for as long time. Uh, the, the numerical uh, instability usually catches up with you. So there are some ways to uh, uh, get rid of the instability, or at least to suppress it significantly. And, um, uh, and what I described is kind of a pedestrian version of why this instability happens. In reality, it's also some coupling to plasma modes. So uh, it's, a, <laughs> it's an aliased wave that couples to a plasma mode. It, it's ugly. But, uh, the basic thing is because the speed of light is not what it should be. So uh, <clears throat> things that do help, and this is what some of the things we do in our code, is to use higher order finite difference time domain methods. So what I described before was what's called second order space, second order time, uh, where the differencing was only uh, nearby cells. Uh, you can also do fourth order differencing. So you can do uh, your special stencil can in involve four cells. Uh, and it turns out that the numerical properties of those waves, uh, of that scheme, is different. Those waves actually propagate faster than the speed of light. So by going to a higher uh, spatial order, you can make the numerical speed of light be faster than the, uh, than the real speed of light. And uh, in that case, if your particles are only limited to the speed of light, this, sh this should be a win. And indeed, uh, this helps. It doesn't completely cure the instability because this is not the only thing that's, that's at play here, but uh, it certainly postpones the inevitable for quite a while. Uh, another thing that really helps is filtering. Uh, so this filtering is, uh, uh, removes the, low, uh, the you know, high frequency noise, which is part of the thing that's triggering this uh, alias plasma mode. And uh, that certainly helps. So those are the two fixes. They're not cures. Uh, there has been recent work on curing this instability, and uh, particularly from uh, UCLA and UC Berkeley. Uh, and um, the reason why people are interested in this is because uh, laser plasma interaction crowd and needs to propagate, or beam plasma interaction, they, they need to propagate uh, relativistic beams through their simulations. And uh, it's very beneficial for them to be in the frame of the beam, in which case the plasma is moving towards the beam. And uh, that plasma can move relativistically, and they, run, they ran into this uh, problem, and uh, uh, they have more resources than us, so they actually dedicated a few graduate students to the problem. And uh, they, there, is a, there are several papers now that uh, say that it's possible to fix it, and uh, we haven't implemented it yet, but uh, it's... Um, it's an active area of research. I, uh, there are usually some trade-offs that you have to do. There is, there is usually not a one cure that fits everything, but uh, I'm told that there are developments. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> all right, so what are the um, boundary conditions that we can apply? And uh, let me see if I have it here. Right, so that, that was just what happens inside of the simulation grid. Now let's talk about what happens on the periphery. So. There are uh, simple boundary conditions that you can apply. So periodic boundary condition is uh, quite straightforward. Basically, you have a ghost zone, and uh, you populate this ghost zone 
with information from the first dawn on this end, and it goes on on this end, it's populated with information from there, and um, uh, that works uh, very well. Uh, remembering that uh, electric fields are offset from the location of the magnetic field, so you have to remember where things are on the grid. Uh, the, another condition that's very easy to put in is the uh, perfectly conducting walls. So uh, <coughs> the physics of perfectly conducting wall is that the tangential component of electric field uh, tangential to surface has to go to zero. So this is very easy. You just go and find electric fields along the surface of, of your wall, and you set them to zero. Uh, the perpendicular fields are... Uh, that's actually not right. Uh, the perpendicular fields don't change. So whatever they are, they don't change. So you, you don't actually don't need to do anything about this. Um, I don't know why, it, why, why this is there. This shouldn't be there. Uh, <coughs> so just setting transverse electric field to zero is enough. This works great, except uh, if you have a situation where your shape that you're trying to simulate is not conformal to the grid. In which case, uh, like for, we usually try to simulate stars, and stars are s circles or spheres, and you put it on a Cartesian grid, so you end up with stair stepping. Uh, so you end up you know, having that <laughs> stair step sphere. And uh, there are corners to that grid, and those corners sometimes can make ugly things. So um, basically, if you can avoid corners, that's good. So there are some methods for doing what's called cut cells, which consider a real surface going through the cell and consider how much volume is occupied by the conductor, how much is not. In our experience, the thing that really works well is kind of smoothing the boundary. So we can say that the, the boundary is not just one sharp thing, but rather a smooth, uh, smooth transition. And we can switch from uh, completely killing transverse electric field to killing part of it and, and you know, with a, some sort of a tench profile uh, that uh, helps in uh, smoothing out this, uh, this transition. Okay, another th condition that is uh, very useful is uh, open boundary condition. And um, here, <coughs> there, are, there are some methods. Uh, they're, not, uh, they're not all perfect. So <coughs> the, what people typically do, there are uh, two possibilities. One is uh, try to do uh, an absorbing uh, boundary. So this is... Uh, this set of schemes is uh, either called absorbing layer or a perfectly matched layer. And uh, the idea here is to add some sort of a dissipative term to your Maxwell's equations. So you say that there is a region on the grid which has finite conductivity. And um, uh, this, you can see, will just damp out your electric fields. Uh, and you can add also magnetic conductivity and, uh, or resistivity, so, so to speak, and it will kill your magnetic fields. Uh, it turns out that there is a, um, this works. I mean, this, it's not perfect. There is some reflection. If you, you usually have to ramp up this uh, conductivity over a few cells. Um, there is a better way. It's called the perfectly matched layer, uh, which was proposed by Behringer in a series of papers in the mid-90s, and there are subsequent papers citing this. Uh, here, you kind of imagine a strange medium uh, which has separate conductivities for electric fields and magnetic fields. And uh, so there is sigma and sigma star. And um, uh, this medium, these conductivities can be adjusted in an interesting way to completely eliminate all, all reflections of electromagnetic waves and vacuum. And um, <coughs> I won't give you the mathematics, but uh, this works. Uh, the downside is that it... Um, you have to increase the number of field equations that you're solving. So there's new extra components of electric fields that, uh, so basically you split your electric field into s something that looks like one polarization, another polarization of electric field, and you apply different dampings to both of them. And um, that complicates the code, but uh, if, if, there, you know, if, uh, if perfectly outflowing boundary conditions are important to you, that's worth investing your time. Uh, into doing this. Now, uh, of course, this only works for vacuum electromagnetic fields. There is no re guarantee that this will work for particles. And uh, in fact, when particles try to leave through these walls, uh, if uh, you have a net charge that's, uh, that's leaving, 
So if you have some surface which accumulates net charge that's leaving through that wall, it will get charged, uh, as it should, <laughs> right? Because there is no grounding strip behind your uh, simulation box. Uh, so the, the downside of doing these charge conservative schemes is they really, they really uh, respect charge conservation. Uh, and uh, I, sometimes I find that you know, if I want to postulate boundary conditions, I'm, I have to think about what you would actually do in the laboratory. So if you, if you were actually to set this device in the lab, where would you put the grounding strip? <laughs> because if you don't, the thing will charge up and it will uh, kill itself. So, um, <clears throat> uh, so with, when particles cross this, um, most of the time it's okay, but if there is a net, uh, a lot of charge that's passing through this wall, uh, you may need to neutralize it. So you may need to add some uh, other, other sign of charge to, uh, or, dis or diffuse this charge in the ghost zones to, um, to neutralize it. Uh, so that's one, one way. Another way is um, uh, this boundary condition proposed by Lindman in 1975. Uh, this is uh, uh, called a transmitting wall, and uh, it actually works quite well, um, and you don't need uh, this perfectly matched layer idea. Uh, it works by saying that the uh, the outer domain, the outer edge of the domain, is uh, experiencing a electromagnetic wave that's crossing normally to the wall. So this works, uh, uh, so it adjusts the ghost zones to uh, match a pure outgoing wave solution. And uh, this works well uh, if your angle of incidence is roughly 90 degrees. So it doesn't work well for very oblique waves. So if you're box, uh, if your wall is far away from your sources, then you're likely to have mostly normal waves coming to your wall, and then it's okay. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> if it's too close to your source, then this may not work as well. You will get some reflections. But this is fairly cheap uh, and com compared to perfectly matched layer. So that's actually the one that we normally use uh, if, we don't, if we don't have to use perfectly matched layer. Okay, um, let's see. All right, this I talked about. Right, okay. Other things people uh, implement in different codes is uh, what's called a moving window. Uh, so this is, um, uh, helps in these beam plasma interaction, for example. Uh, it says that the whole simulation, the, the window of the simulation is flying uh, at some high speed. And uh, typically, the speed at which it's useful to fly the simulation, the speed of light. So basically, you shift everything in your, in your box back at the speed of light. This uh, eliminates all possible problems with your um, outer walls, because the, no wave should ever reach your outer wall, uh, because it's moving at the speed of light. So that really is a cheap way of solving your outflow boundary conditions. Uh, but uh, the downside, of course, is that your, your thing is flying at the speed of light, everything in the box is going to be flying slower than the speed of light, so eventually your beam will slip with respect to your box. And, uh, but it certainly gives you more, more time to study the interaction. So this is what's done in beam plasma interaction. We've also used it for relativistic shocks, and uh, it works, uh, for, works fairly well. Um, right. <clears throat> right, another thing that you have to worry about is injection of particles. Uh, if you have sources uh, or sinks of particles. And um, uh, as I mentioned, we try to inject everything in pairs, so electron and ion or electron-positron pairs. And um, you can have injectors that are uh, either stationary in the box or they're moving through the box. Uh, and also we have this uh, scheme of uh, expanding domain. So this is very useful for uh, shock simulations because what we typically study is um, uh, what we have is a flow that's impacting a wall, and uh, so it hits the reflecting wall, and then there is a shock that starts to propagate in, into your box. So uh, it makes no sense to have this whole box there from the very beginning, because the real interaction only starts to happen here. So it really makes sense to make your box this big, and then expand the box a little faster than the, the shock is moving, right? And then. This way, you will still simulate whatever in front of the shock, but you didn't waste all of your time uh, pushing empty plasma. So 
<coughs> we, this way we can do um, larger problems where box is expanding with time and uh, the injector will be moving uh, with this expanding box. Uh, and it will putting, putting more plasma into the simulation. Okay, so um, uh, some notes on uh, parallelization. So it's fairly straightforward. Uh, the main decomposition is what most people use. Uh, and uh, <coughs> you can do either you know, 1D decomposition or 2D decomposition and, uh, or 3D decomposition. And uh, this um, uh, makes you liable for more uh, messages that need to be passed. So uh, in 3D, you may have to communicate with up to 26 uh, other CPUs. And uh, you have to communicate the boundary uh, values uh, back and forth. So in practice, um, at least in our runs, we don't see that uh, the main decomposition is, uh, you know, the, all of the message passing is not, doesn't seem to be a large time sink. Uh, most of the time is still spent in particles and, and deposition. And uh, so this is not a, a very big concern. And uh, it does show up in good scaling of big codes. So, uh, this is, for example, a, a plot from the UCLA code of Cyrus. Uh, you see very nice scaling with number of cores. Uh, this is one of the codes that we've used in our group called Zeltron. Uh, and um, <coughs> you can see uh, very nice scaling with number of cores, uh, basically because these codes don't require a lot of communication. It's mainly, uh, mainly local interaction. Now, you can get into trouble with load balancing. So uh, if you have a place in your box that uh, ends up having more particles than the others, then of course that node will slow down and that's going to be your weakest link. And uh, your whole simulation will not run faster than that CPU. And uh, for uniform plasma problems, this is not typically an issue. Uh, well, because there isn't much density uh, gradients. But if you do shocks uh, or if you do reconnection, you can get into trouble. So for example, for a shock, uh, the, the simulation I just described to you hitting that wall, that will launch a compression. That compression will be at least a factor of four in density. Uh, so if I uniformly divide my domain in, in this direction, there will be CPUs that are doing four times as much work. Uh, so what we do is we do this dynamic uh, readjustment where we uh, send some of the parts of the domain to other CPUs, you have to reconfigure your, your uh, situation, send, send information, particles, and fields. Uh, and that really helps. Um, so for example, here is a, uh, a situation where you can also run into trouble, such as reconnection. So here, the, in the current sheet, you can have uh, higher particle density than outside. And uh, this really will benefit from putting more CPUs uh, closer to the action. And uh, so this kind of, uh, it works like the main, uh, li like, like mesh refinement, except it, it, you do it with uh, CPUs, so it, you, it's CPU refinement. Uh, the, um, typically, mesh refinement we, we don't require in PIC. Uh, the, there are some codes that try to do this. So uh, in principle, you, you, I mean, if the density contrast is huge, then you may consider doing uh, uh, refinement in, in space. Uh, by, by that, I mean the resolution of the uh, spatial dimension. So, so the spatial dimension is uh, controlled by the resolution of the skin depth, so C over omega P. Uh, so how many cells you put per skin depth is this effective spatial resolution of your, um, of your simulation. Uh, the skin depth scales at the square root of the density. So, if your density uh, in here is, uh, you know, orders of magnitude more, then you may think about actually trying to make cells smaller and making uh, different number of cells per skin depth in this region. If it's just variations on the order of, you know, b below 10, then uh, constant resolution is fine. Okay, so the, right. <clears throat> so another uh, thing I wanted to discuss is uh, optimization of these codes. 
Um, the, what we've had before uh, in the last you know, 10 years, we were very spoiled that when we go to the next computer system, we went, when we don't do anything to our code, uh, the next generation system was guaranteed to run at least twice as fast as the one before. And uh, it worked great uh, for a while. Now we're stuck with a different problem. Now, the, as we've heard from the night's lending uh, discussion, uh, the CPU makers are just going to stuff more cores onto the uh, CPU, and each core is going to get slower. Uh, but there will be more of them. Uh, so which on the surface doesn't do much for us because uh, our codes really are CPU limited and, uh, and memory limited. And uh, it's not clear how we're going to advance in the, this wild west of uh, next ar computer architectures. So uh, <clears throat> technically, on paper, the formal floating point uh, throughput of these new systems is larger than the one before that. right? And uh, the reason they can do this is because of uh, all of these uh, little cores are, uh, have huge vector units. So they can, in principle, do eight multiplications at the same time. And uh, if you can have a, an algorithm that takes advantage of that, you will eventually win. Uh, but this is an ideal situation, right? So you need to not only have an algorithm that vectorizes very well, you also need to supply numbers to the actual CPU, so memory bandwidth can be uh, an issue. And of course, not every algorithm can vectorize. So for example, I've <laughs> my last month was spent trying to uh, optimize our code for Broadwell, uh, which is this 28-core architecture. And uh, the next one, the Knight's Landing, the 72-core architecture will be uh, even more fun. So uh, basically, before all of this madness, we had the mover and deposit, which were two most expensive parts of the code. So mover was where we pushed Lorentz force. Deposit was where we put the particles down on the grid. And uh, uh, once I removed enough if statements from the mover, the compiler could parallelize it quite nicely. And it was vectorizing it. So, so there is enough uh, to do in the, in the mover that it can do eight floating point operations at once. It, it basically can advance eight particles at the same time, and uh, it, uh, it really speeds up. So mover is great. Uh, so right now, my mover is like you know, one third or one quarter of the deposit step. So now the thing is completely imbalanced. The reason why deposit is so difficult is that there is an algorithmic issue. Basically, the problem is that uh, you, what you're trying to do is you have a grid and you have lots of particles and you're trying to write down particles onto the grid. So you, you need to deposit their current into each individual grid cell. Now, if every particle is totally independent of the other one and just falls into a different grid cell, you're good, right? Then, then you can simultaneously update the memory locations. Now, if two particles fall into the same cell, then, and they're advanced by different uh, vector units on your uh, CPU, you will have a conflict. In principle, you will have a uh, race condition, whoever first updates that, uh, uh, that memory. And uh, of course, compiler notices this and says, I cannot vectorize this, this is, this is not good for you. And uh, it's correct, it, the algorithm is not, is not working. So uh, there are various wiggles that you can try to do, and uh, you can make little private tiles of your current array for every little uh, vector unit, and it can get ugly. Uh, I've seen situations where it can really help, but they're not a very generic configuration. So I'm, I'm, yet, I'm still working on this, and I, you know, if you have ideas how to do this better, let me know. Yes? How much memory limited are you? Pardon? I guess the issue is an issue of how much memory Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so, so these tiles, you have to make them large and small enough so they can fit into the local cache. So you need to worry about all of the, how big the cache is on each individual machine. That, it, it becomes un, very unpleasant. So if your code works on this architecture, it will fail on the next one. And you'll have to do this all over again. So I wish there was a better way. Uh, now, another thing that I, I've seen uh, is that there is kind of a, there are categorical statements on the internet saying that, um, Arrays, sorry, yeah, yeah, structures of arrays are better than arrays of structures. 
uh, for these vectorized units. Um, so basically, this is how you organize your data in memory. So for what we're dealing with is particles. So every particle has at least six numbers associated with it. So you can deal with it as a structure of arrays. So you say that this is my structure particle, which has arrays x of the size of the number of particles, y and z, and so forth. So that's why you, you, you put all of your x's, then you put all of your y's, and so forth. Uh, or you can think of it in a logical way, which is every particle is unique. And for every particle, I will need to know all of its coordinates at the same time. So why not put them close in memory, right? So you can do uh, a uh, array of structures, right? So every, you will have array of the size of n, and every point is a structure of x, y, z, uh, and the velocities. And uh, so this is what we do. And uh, categorical statements on the internet said that this is better. And um, <coughs> I think the jury is still out. What we've heard on, on Wednesday was that uh, for night's landing, this may actually not be that bad. So uh, I haven't seen a significant difference. But uh, this is what, I mean, changing this is kind of doing heart surgery on your code. So it's not something you want to do every day. So. But in your case, you only have the phase space coordinates, right? Nothing else. Right? You also, so we also carry indices of particles. So we, we have to know uh, the, the number of the particle. Like, this is actually an interesting computer science question. So you, you have lots of CPUs. Everyone produces particles. Uh, but then you want to trace a particle in the end. You want to know, uh, you, you want to have a, you know, a trajectory of a particular particle. How do I identify a particle? Because every CPU doesn't know about what the, all the other CPUs are doing. So if, if it assigns a particle number six, there may be another CPU that assigns it number, number six. And how do you do this without communication? So you end up needing to carry two numbers. One is the serial number of the particle on the CPU, and another is the number of CPU on which it was born. And those two unique numbers will make it a unique particle. Then you can trace it. So, so we end up carrying more information here. Uh, but roughly on the order of nine floating point uh, numbers. <clears throat> OK, so uh, these are the uh, codes uh, uh, that you can find on <coughs> that mo a, a lot of groups are using. So uh, I showed you this uh, exupic code, which is a two-dimensional relativistic PIC code. And, uh, there is a free version on, uh, online. Uh, it um, works on Linux. Uh, the Mac and Windows one, you have to get it through a company called TechX, and I think they want money for it. But there is some sort of uh, trial version, so it, it may, may be worth your time. I don't know. But the 2D version on Linux is free. And if you can succeed to install it on Mac, let me know. Uh, so there is also uh, a 3D version of, of the same vintage. Uh, it's called Warpal. Uh, again, this is uh, sold by company TechX. So a lot of these, when there are companies involved, this is because these codes have practical uh, applications. Uh, so either for um, uh, laser plasma interaction, uh, la particle acceleration in, in accelerators, or uh, plasma processing. So you can do these things for low energy plasmas, which is used for semiconductor processing and all sorts of uh, interactions between boundaries and plasmas is, uh, uh, can be done with these codes. So, um, so this is our code, Tristan, uh, which originated with a serial version from uh, Oscar Buniman, back, which was written back in the 90s. And I made it uh, parallel and uh, optimized it for relativistic uh, flows, and so this is what you can play with right now. Then there is a, a big collaboration uh, led by uh, UCLA and Lisbon uh, on doing OSIRIS. Uh, so this is a 3D, also 3D RPIC codes, also used for plasma accelerator research for plasma astrophysics, et cetera. Uh, so their capabilities are to zero thought are comparable, but OSIRIS obviously is a much more developed code. It has more ap applications, and it has more uh, boundary conditions and uh, all sorts of other bells and whistles. Uh, and, um, <clears throat> but I don't think it's public, right? It, I, th I think you can't, you, can, you, yeah, you, you have to be in the collaboration. Uh, then there are a few codes that you can find, uh, like UpRT and PIC on GPU. I think PIC on GPU is totally open source, uh, and uh, this is being developed for GPU applications. 
Um, then there are a few more commercial codes like LSP. This is, um, you see this uh, in many national laboratories. They use this code at both particle and cell and hybrid code, uh, and uh, I think also MHD. So this is used quite a bit um, in the laboratories. And, um, <clears throat> right. So they're all roughly doing the same thing, uh, but they're all tuned for different problems, and it's, sometimes it's hard to compare them. Uh, and uh, some use different formulations, like using vector fields versus real fields, and uh, sorry, vector potential versus, uh, uh, versus vector fields. And uh, this um, direct comparison is very rarely done, especially if you have a very complicated code. But uh, I think we agree, like, at least on the plasma astrophysics side, I think runs done with Osiris and Tristan agree quite well. Uh, and um, I think on the astrophysical applications, things usually uh, seem to converge for different codes. Okay, uh, so some um, uh, extensions to the standard model that are being worked on and, and used. Uh, this uh, going to different geometries. So we started with Cartesian geometry, but in principle, there is nothing preventing you to go into spherical geometry. So define a difference time domain method works very similarly. Uh, you have to worry about what to do on the axis. Uh, so the <coughs> there is uh, there are some fixes that you can do, but uh, having a nice electromagnetic wave propagate right across your axis is non-trivial. Uh, you may have to switch to Cartesian geometry right around the axis. But if you can, if your code, uh, if your problem can tolerate not having waves going through the axis, then uh, this can be done. Uh, so there are several codes, like Zeltron has a uh, spherical code, uh, Bilaev has a spherical code, and uh, the Columbia group has a, a spherical code as well. This is mostly used for um, pulsar applications, and I'll talk about pulsar applications uh, later this week. Uh, other things you <coughs> people, people do is to add radiation to the codes. So <coughs> here the uh, synchrotron radiation is not resolved on the grid. So obviously it's high, much higher frequency radiation, so we don't capture it on our, uh, on our grid. And um, uh, we can um, add the energy loss from this radiation as a separate force. So you can add both momentum loss and energy loss by adding an extra term to your uh, evolution equation. And um, here you can have the, we, we use this uh, radiation reaction formula from Landau and Lifshitz, and uh, it seems to work quite well in uh, you know, slowing down the particle and changing its momentum as it, uh, as it loses uh, radiation. So um, what we found is, at least for pulsar applications, which I'll talk about later, is that uh, there are some terms that are relativistic in this formula and some terms that are non-relativistic, and it's very uh, tempting to get rid of the non-relativistic ones. Uh, and the... Um, Moral is that don't do that. Uh, they actually are important. And if you don't do that, you get rid of various cur curvature drifts, and uh, this can really screw up your life. So uh, don't touch the very beautiful formulae. Uh, OK, so also you can do uh, inverse Compton radiation. So you can do, um, if you have an external source, you can add a force from Compton scattering back, back onto your particle. So obviously, the, once you start adding these forces, uh, this breaks the uh, dimensionless approach to, the, uh, to plasma physics that PIC has maintained so far. Because what, before, if you've scaled everything in units of plasma skin depths uh, and uh, <coughs> cyclotron frequencies, then it doesn't matter how big your plasma skin depth is. It could be a millimeter, it could be a parsec. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, once you introduce radiation, you break that, because now the absolute value of magnetic field in Tesla is important, because that sets your time, time scale for radiation. Okay, other things that people do is uh, <laughs> add pair creation and also add QED effects, uh, and uh, this is, uh, turns out to be important uh, in the laboratory, because you can have, uh, in principle, you can have lasers exceed the uh, QED strengths of the electric field of 10 to the 13 uh, Gauss, 
And uh, in this uh, electric field, you can have pair formation from vacuum, as you will pull apart the uh, virtual electron-positron pairs. And you can have a pair avalanche uh, in between two lasers. And there are very interesting techniques uh, from the Lisbon group uh, where uh, how to handle these avalanches, how to uh, contain the number of particles to be finite, because in principle, out of nothing, you can get an infinite number of particles being created in your simulation. So you need to be able to combine particles together while maintaining the properties of the phase space. So a lot of interesting work done here. Uh, also, the, uh, this pair production is important for uh, astrophysical applications, for example, in pulsars. And uh, <coughs> here, uh, simulations of pulsars and, uh, and, and magnetars are being done now with particle and cell, where pair production is included uh, as a source term. Uh, and I'll talk about this later. Uh, other things uh, we've, we've been doing is, um, we've been kind of forced into this uh, regime, is we realized that, at least for pulsars, uh, flat space is not enough. You actually need to include GR effects. Uh, and um, <coughs> we, uh, so we've seen this formulas in uh, Lewis Leonard's talks. Uh, so there's a lapse function that, uh, that uh, gets uh, introduced. And uh, what we do is we modify the equations, the Maxwell equations, to be in the uh, curved space-time. And uh, you get this lapse function entering your uh, curls and also modifying the currents and uh, modifying the Faraday equation. And uh, what this uh, does is it introduces a drag of the uh, space-time. Uh, so you can have uh, a particle will feel gravitomagnetic forces uh, as it's sitting next to the rotating object. So these, uh, intra these, um, uh, these terms uh, modify Maxwell's equation. We've added this to our code, and this really helps in uh, simulating pair production uh, next to pulsars. I'll, I'll probably talk about it next in the next lecture. Uh, another variation on this theme is uh, <coughs> um, Another thing you can do with kinetic simulations is these uh, hybrid simulations. So this, uh, so far I've talked about modeling both electrons and ions as kinetic particles, but uh, in some situations, uh, you're only interested in the ion dynamics. You're not that interested in the electron dynamics. The electron scales are much shorter than the ion scales. So um, you can have, um, <clears throat> you want to in increase the separation of scales that you can study. And uh, for that, you can treat um, electrons as a uh, neutralizing fluid and use electrons uh, n without modeling, modeling them as kinetic particles. So for example, this is useful for modeling shock acceleration uh, if you're interested in only the physics of cosmic rays or acceleration of co uh, protons, and you're not that interested in acceleration of electrons. So if you are to resolve both things, you'll be uh, doing a very long simulation. Uh, but you can get rid of the, if you can get rid of the electrons, you can speed up your simulation quite a bit. So the way this works is um, you, uh, ions or protons are still particle and cell uh, methods. So they're, they're still particles, they're kinetic particles being advanced with uh, Lorentz force. Um, the electrons are treated as a neutralizing fluid. So we're assuming that they're massless, they have no inertia. And uh, uh, their equation of motion then looks like this. So no inertia means that the, this, this side is equal to zero. And this is the balance of forces that electrons are experiencing. So electrons are experiencing the Lorentz force. And there's also a pressure gradient of the electrons. Uh, <coughs> and uh, right. once you go through. Uh, through calculations, what you find is that uh, the equations of hybrid system look like this. So there is an um, uh, evolution equation for the magnetic field, the BDT is equal to curl of E. But the electric field uh, comes from the, uh, this electron equation of motion, which uh, essentially says that the electric field is the V cross B plus the term that has to do with the gradient of the electron pressure plus a term that depends on the uh, hole drift, so B cross, uh, B cross J. Uh, and uh, 
this velocity here, the v cross b, so technically it should be the electron velocity, but uh, you, you only have available the ion velocity. So you assume that, uh, so, so this, this expansion stems out from starting, s starting with elect electric field equals to v, v electron cross b and then ends up as being this ion velocity, the electron pressure gradient in this uh, whole term. So um, essentially what, what you do here is electric field is um, a state vari variable. It's, it's, it, it's not evolved explicitly. It, you get it once you know the velocity of the ions, once you know the magnetic field and uh, some prescriptions for electron pressure gradient. And uh, then electric field, you, you just use this Ohm's law and then you can evolve the particles again. So you can evolve ions further. Uh, and um, <clears throat> you can see that uh, this pressure gradient of electrons, uh, you don't know that a priori because you don't model the electrons. So you have to assume something about the electron pressure. And what you typically say is that it's adiabatic. And, uh, but the adiabatic index may be uh, not your normal uh, ideal uh, gas law. Because in principle, if you have, say, a shock, uh, the, what you want to model is how the electrons respond as they're heated at the shock. And that's usually not adiabatic. So the adiabatic index of electrons could be something uh, funny. But uh, what you do is that you say that the electron pressure is the uh, density of electrons to some power uh, gamma. Uh, and the density of electrons is assumed to be equal to the density of the ions. Right? So this way you can uh, put something into this pressure term. Uh, so what you do is you compute at every step, you can compute the density of ions and the velocity of ions, and then use these things to compute the electric field and advance the particles forward. Now, uh, uh, <coughs> the actual time evolution of these equations is a little bit convoluted. So there is just 12 steps here. Uh, and. Uh, you can, you can read Matt Kunz's paper about this. Uh, the difficulty is, um, I guess, if we go back here, so these are the, these are the discretized equations. This is the, uh, <coughs> the Ohm's law. Uh, this is the, uh, the Faraday equation. And the, uh, so what, 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 uh, what happens is that the, uh, you need to maintain proper uh, cent centering of uh, magnetic fields and electric fields in time. So what you do know is electric field at time n, but what you need to advance magnetic field is electric field in the future. So you end up doing this um, kind of predictor-corrector uh, scheme where you try to advance your equations by a half step into the future, use that value to advance another half step, and uh, average these two and then use a real time step. So it becomes a little bit convoluted and uh, you end up pushing the ions at least twice per time step. So hybrid simulations, you know, they, they cut out some physics, they, they make things faster, but they're not simpler conceptually. So the actual time, time evolution of it is, is non-trivial. Uh, another interesting side effect is um, the convergence properties of these uh, simulations. So there are uh, <coughs> modes that, uh, that you can recover in this hybrid simulation. So the, this is the omega versus k for two modes. This is an alpha wave, and this is a Whistler wave. And uh, <coughs> what happens is that, um, so the alpha wave at, uh, uh, at, at long wavelengths, everything is fine. They're, they're roughly uh, similar. At short wavelengths, you can see this uh, Whistler wave starts to run away. So uh, it has a dispersion relation where omega goes like k squared. And uh, in real physics, uh, this runaway stops on the electron scales. So this, this doesn't continue to, to, to infinity. It, it gets shut off by electrons. Uh, in a hybrid simulation, you don't have that physics. So you don't know anything about the electrons. So in principle, there is a wave that starts running faster and faster the more you refine the grid. So if you you would think that you know, if you make better and better resolution on the grid, everything should become better. But in fact, you have this wave that starts to run faster and faster as you refine your grid. So you have to get rid of this. And uh, people get rid of this by actually filtering the fields. Uh, 
And uh, so, so they cut off this uh, high, high spatial frequency um, uh, uh, waves, and uh, that makes the code stable and potentially uh, can lead to resolution convergence. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention here is that I, um, I talked about filtering of currents uh, in particle and cell code. I never said that we filter fields. Uh, so in fact, we never filter fields. Uh, because this is something very dangerous. If you actually filter fields, you can totally kill your charge conservation, and then you have big problems in your code. Uh, if your code is not charge conservative, such as uh, these hybrid simulations, then you don't have to worry about it, and you can actually filter the fields. Okay, so um, are there uh, any questions about this so far? Right. Uh, it's um, it's a. I mean, it's hard to explain, uh, but it's it's easy to show. Okay, so we, I guess we should have done this at some point in this school, shouldn't we? Um, so these are the different kinds of waves you have in plasma. So this is a fast wave or a compressional alpha N wave. So here you see the uh, compression in the magnetic field uh, propagates, okay? Uh, this is a uh, shear alpha N wave. So here you're wiggling the, the magnetic field like this, right? And you see propagation of the uh, of the wave. Uh, this is an oblique fast wave. So you, you, it has a, uh, it goes at, at an angle to the direction of the magnetic field. Okay. These are Langmuir oscillations. So this is just electrostatic oscillations along the magnetic field. And you can see how electrons are going up and down, responding to the uh, potential wave. Uh, So this is our this is the Whistler wave. Uh, lower hybrid wave. I have to click on it. But um, so it's a gyrational motion uh, around the magnetic. So it's a circularly polarized wave, uh, and uh, it, uh, at long wavelengths it looks sort of like an alpha N wave. It's a, one of the polarizations of an alpha N wave. But when we go to short wavelengths, it it uh, uh, starts to get electrostatic contributions from the electrons. So, so it has a pressure of electrons associated with it. And uh, uh, I wish I had a better explanation, but <laughs> it's, a, it's a short wavelength circularly polarized wave, uh, which connects to one of the branches of the alpha uh, What? So the, the reason they're called whistlers is because uh, of this dispersive property that omega goes like k squared. So the, um, the, fast, the short wavelength waves come first. So when you have uh, lightning strikes uh, in Australia, that launches waves uh, in the magnetosphere, and you hear them as <whistles> right? Because the, the high frequency comes first. That's why they're called whistlers. Uh, and that's... lower hybrid wave. So it, it has a gyrational contribution and the electrostatic contribution. So it's a, it's a mess. Okay, so uh, the 
<coughs> so I, I told you about the, the uh, description of how these methods work, and uh, the electrostatic method, I think, is quite well understood, and there is now there's an analytical theory of how these actual numerical plasmas work. Uh, the electromagnetic counterpart to that doesn't really exist. Uh, so there are, um, <coughs> you know, multidimensional theory of the simulational uh, of the plasma in the simulation uh, is not is not well developed, and I'm not sure it's possible to do be because it's a multidimensional uh, problem, such as there isn't many real plasma physics in multi dimensions. Uh, but um, nevertheless, there is some interesting interactions between the numerical discretization and, and plasma physics. So uh, the long-term uh, stability of these uh, simulations is uh, very interesting and very important. We, uh, in the course of astrophysical simulations, we're forced to push these simulations for very long time scales. And uh, uh, whether these things are actually stable on time scales longer than, say, 100,000 uh, plasma times, uh, hasn't been rigorously demonstrated. So the, these methods typically don't conserve energy, uh, and, uh, but how badly they do with energy has to do with your numerical resolution. So uh, keeping track of how well you're converged in, in energy over a very long-term simulation can be very expensive. And uh, uh, usually, the way I've been dealing with this is I try to find a I try to simulate an effect that is, by definition, much larger than the numerical effect. So you're trying to so look for some, some large perturbation, uh, such as a shock. You know, a shock is a very high compression in plasma. It's very hard to miss. Uh, if you're looking for a decay of a very small wave, then this is going to be a very difficult method to use for a very long time. So it's not impossible, and as computers get faster, it probably will become more useful, but uh, there is, a, there is some danger here. Uh, so, <clears throat> nevertheless, you know, pushing it to higher, to longer time scales, larger spatial scales, uh, is very interesting for the astrophysical application. So, um, I've been, uh, uh, right, so here are some of the applications that people have used particle and cell for. Uh, so, this is uh, back to the laboratory plasmas. This is the uh, interaction between a beam or a laser and the plasma, which creates electrostatic uh, oscillations in the plasma. So this is a beam going to the left. It expels plasma over here. It converges back here. And there is an electrostatic uh, field that's created by ex excluding this plasma away uh, that uh, can, in principle, provide huge gradients, uh, huge accelerating gradients. And uh, uh, GeVs per meter and uh, you know, if you had an electron riding on this wave, you could, in principle, reach uh, uh, G, you know, 100 GeVs in a very small device, tabletop accelerator. That was the dream for, the, for this field for many years. And um, people are making good progress on this uh, uh, with simulations and now experiments. And you can drive it either with a laser beam or you can drive it with an electron beam and uh, create these uh, accelerated particles. They certainly have been seen. The question is, uh, can you make a really uh, good beam out of this? Can you make a uh, very high quality beam that you can actually use for particle physics applications? There's also some medical applications of this. You can, if you can have uh, accelerators on the tabletop, you can have, uh, you know, radiation treatments uh, with uh, accelerated particles. So that's a big area uh, of research right now. Uh, to um, illustrate some of the astrophysical applications. I'll use this example. Uh, and uh, this is actually one of the first simulations that I did in, in astrophysical plasmas uh, with particle and cell. And uh, it was motivated by um, this uh, interesting uh, astrophysical system called the double pulsar. So uh, the, I, this was discovered in 2004. And um, there are two uh, neutron stars orbiting each other. Uh, one of them is a millisecond pulsar. Another one is a uh, uh, second pulsar. So it's a, a slow pulsar. And um, uh, for a few years, we actually saw both of them pulse, which makes amazing tests of general relativity, et cetera. But uh, from my perspective, I was interested in how the two magnetospheres actually uh, interacted. Because um, 
the wind from one of the pulsars was overwhelming the magnetosphere of the other one. And it was, uh, the wind was pushing on the magnetosphere of the slow pulsar and uh, it was really perturbing it. And uh, in fact, you could detect uh, the, the um, period of the fast pulsar imprinted in the radio emission from the slow pulsar, which means that somehow this thing was tugging on the magnetosphere of the slow pulsar and imprinting its period, uh, which, is, uh, which was interesting. So I, I, was, I tried to simulate this using particle and cell method. Um, in retrospect, I should have used probably relativistic MHD, but I didn't have it at the time. And I was, you know, cavalier at the time. And uh, I just thought, well, why not try it with particle and cell? And it, it's strangely, you can do this. So um, <clears throat> on the surface, this seems totally insane because the scales that you can simulate with uh, particle and cell method are tiny, you know, skin depth. Uh, and uh, here, the, <laughs> the separation between these two stars is probably billions or trillions of skin depths. Each magnetosphere can be, you know, millions of skin depths, et cetera. So uh, there is no way I could have simulated this on the computer. But it turned out that um, once your size of the system becomes roughly larger than 50 skin depths, uh, the MHD behavior is recovered. So if you're under that, you get interesting plasma effects, but at a large scale, you get, uh, if, you, if your system size is larger than 50 skin depths, uh, you get into sort of MHD regime. So um, <laughs> I recently reread Birdsell and Langdon, which is a, a good book on particle and cell method, and there is this uh, quote that I found. It says, caution is required, but one can be paralyzed by a conservative attitude into missing profitable applications. So, uh, at the time, I didn't know this, and so I just dived in, and this is a simulation from particle and cell method. So basically, what I did here is um, to simulate a wind. So this is a moving uh, magnetized wind. Uh, so initially, it's going to the right. And uh, what I did here is I put in a, uh, uh, a essentially a current loop. So you put it, uh, so, you know, this code solves Maxwell's equation, so I can put any kinds of currents I want. So I put in a current loop here, and uh, this current loop inflated a magnetic field, and it inflated a dipole magnetic field, because that's what current loops do. And uh, <laughs> depending on which way uh, this, uh, well, first of all, once it inflated the loop, you could see that you formed some sort of a bow shock. Right, so this, is what sh this shows the density of the plasma. So you can see that there is a, uh, some sort of a feature here which is interpreted as a bow shock. And uh, there is a compression here. Uh, you can see the magnetic field lines get compressed. The so magnetic field increased, density increased, that's good. Uh, this is a low density region because I inflated this magnetic bubble inside of the uh, conducting wind and it expelled, uh, expelled plasma from here. Now, uh, this thing is actually spinning, so if you, put in several loops of, uh, of current and you phase them correctly, you can make a rotating magnetic field. So that's what I did. And after half a turn, you see this. So what happened is that the polarity of the magnetic field reversed. And uh, now I have reconnection here. So the magnetic field is in a different direction than the magnetic field over here. And you start getting reconnection. You can see how the shape of the magnetic field changed how the shape of the interaction region changed. And you can also start seeing uh, particles streaming down towards the uh, surface of the, of the star. Uh, and uh, also you start seeing magnetotail. So this kind of thing is very representative of what happens in the uh, Earth uh, interaction with solar wind. So you get solar, solar wind reconnection events, which happen over here, and then there's plasma that streams back onto the, uh, onto the polar cap and creates an aurora. Right. So the same things happen here, uh, and they, they can be applied to this uh, pulsar. So the reason I brought this up is that in one slide, this demonstrated the three things I was studying for the next 15 years. So I was studying shocks, I was studying pulsars, and I was studying reconnection. So they were all in one simulation, but of course this was horrible resolution, and uh, I, I then focused on the shock, I then focused on the pulsar, and I then focused on the reconnection. So I'll, I'll, I'll show examples of all of these things next time, but this is the movie of this, uh, of this simulation. So <clears throat> you can see here that uh, the 
shape of the bow shock is obviously varying as the, as the thing is spinning. And uh, you can get both reconnecting side and the compression side. <coughs> and also plasma gets into the cusp here, uh, which can have potential implications on how it suppresses radio emission. For example, this pulsar is only seen for some parts of the uh, orbit. Not, doesn't, it's not seen all the time. So this may be because in some parts of the orbit it gets hit by this uh, plasma on the cusp. Um, this is the same simulation in 3D. So you can see uh, some representative field lines in plane. Uh, and uh, I believe this is a 90 degree inclination. So the magnetic field was in plane of the simulation, in, in this plane. The, the dipole axis was in this, sorry, the dipole yeah, vector was in this plane. And this is the three-dimensional shape of the density. Right. And this is what happened if the magnetic moment is at some angle to the, to the flow. You can, you can get uh, it alternating effects, which are now not only in the plane of this simulation. And here you can see how uh, the wind field lines either connect to the star or don't. So you can, in principle, have communication between the star and the wind on some parts of the spin of the, um, of the neutron star. So um, another example of application, so this, is, this was kind of the application of particle and cell where it shouldn't be used. Uh, where it should be used as a, uh, things that have to do with uh, intrinsic degrees of freedom of the plasma and uh, instabilities due to counter streaming. So this uh, particular one is uh, what's called Weibull instability. And uh, this comes about if you have two uh, plasmas that try to stream through each other. And uh, just to imagine here the electrons from both sides, they're going through each other. And now imagine a uh, fluctuation of the magnetic field and uh, this fluctuation of the magnetic field will deflect electrons, and it will deflect them in such a way that these electrons will deflect to the left, these will deflect to the left, but as a, as a result, you have an excess of right-going uh, electrons over here, an excess of left-going electrons over here, which makes for an extra current, and this current acts to amplify the magnetic field perturbation that was there in the first place. So, uh, sorry. So this makes for a this makes for a exponential instability. So you can grow magnetic fields from nothing. Uh, just have two kinds of streaming beams, and uh, they will uh, grow magnetic field uh, as they evolve. So this is a simulation of these. Uh, counter streaming instability. So in this case, the flows are going uh, through, the, uh, through the plane of the board. And what you're looking at is the uh, magnetic energy. So these filaments, uh, so the, the, the current filaments into these uh, loops. And uh, this is magnetic field is going around the current filaments. Uh, so this is what happens um, when the two densities of two plasmas are the same. Uh, if the density of one plasma is smaller than the other, you can see that the loops become more uh, coherent and they look like cell division in reverse. And uh, this is what happens when one beam is much smaller density than the, than the other beam. So these kinds of... Uh, Simulations are fun because you can study how the, so initially there was no magnetic field, but as time evolves, you get this magnetic field configurations and magnetic energy is increasing. Ultimately, it saps the energy from the uh, beams that are going through each other. And um, these kinds of um, uh, counter streaming instabilities are very important for the structure of uh, shock waves. So in a shock, uh, you have effectively uh, a fast flow trying to encounter a slow flow, and uh, as they stream through each other, 
Uh, this is unstable to various uh, filamentation instabilities, which look like what I showed you before. So you see these loops and these little, uh, little, little loops and large loops, and that's what happens in the transverse direction as two flows are trying to cross through each other, creating magnetic fields, and these magnetic fields deflect the flow. So uh, this kind of um, simulation is essential to understanding the microphysics of shock transitions, how viscosity comes about without any collisions, how plasma can slow down without any Coulomb interactions. So this is what we'll uh, talk about in the, in the next lecture uh, on Thursday, I believe. Uh, and um, we'll go into more applications of this particle and cell method for astrophysical um, situations. In the afternoon, I think we have a uh, uh, homework session. So I'm, I'll be here. We can discuss uh, how to run codes, how to use codes, and uh, I can show you some more examples of how these codes work. Okay. Thank you.